angajar, o personalitate cu siguranță de referință a neurologiei contemporane. Domnia sa este aici, la București, și apoi va fi și în țară, la Sinaia, la Cluj, în calitate de, sigur, de profesor, de medic ilustru, dar și de laureat al primei ediții a premiilor Constantin Brâncoveanu International, ediție care a avut loc în 2018 și s-a încheiat cu o ceremonie la New York. Despre Fundația Alexandrion, la noi se știu de mult, destul de multe lucruri, dar aș profita de prilej pentru a menționa totuși câteva noutăți. Prima se referă la evoluția programelor fundației. Știți prea bine, Fundația Alexandrion este susținută de Alexandrion Group, condus de cermanul grupului de domnul Salameh, iar această fundație s-a consacrat în spațiul României ca fiind cea mai implicată fundație privată, cea mai solidă inițiativă privată de susținere a unor branșe, cum sunt sportul, artele, cultura și altele în societatea românească. Se poate observa în ultimii ani o evoluție certă a programelor fundației. Știm bine, fundația a debutat cu programe de premieră în sport, în artă, între timp, ea s-a mișcat și acordă premii în domeniul științei. Fundația a acordat premii pentru intelectuali consacrați, în general seniori, dar recent ea acordă și premii pentru tineri. Matei Brâncoveanu, după numele fiului lui Constantin Brâncoveanu. De asemenea, fundația a premiat la început întreprinzători, mai nou premiază și cercetători cu rezultate excepționale. În sfârșit, fundația a alocat premii naționale, mai nou ați putut observa la Londra, la München, fundația a acordat și premii pentru diaspora. Și, și mai nou, cum spuneam pe parcurs, fundația a trecut la premiile internaționale Constantin Brâncoveanu. Iată, deci, o evoluție a programelor fundației Alexandrion. Mai este un aspect de remarcat, și anume, fundația nu numai că acordă premii pentru rezultate, dar susține acțiuni de, să spunem direct, stimularea dezbaterii de idei din România. În acest sens, sigur, suntem acum în fața ediției a patra a dezbaterilor de la Sinaia. Deci Sinaia, aproape de București, probabil că încă n-ați fost des la Sinaia, dar pentru dezbateri n-ați fost, dar sunt convins că o să vă convingem să veniți, pentru că dezbaterea a patra va fi tot pe o temă fierbinte, și anume reorganizarea Uniunii Europene. Iată, deci, foarte succint, succint evoluția programelor fundației. Orice fundație are o deviză, dacă vreți să formulăm deviza cât mai succint în frumoasa engleză, aceasta este, în mod clar, daring, caring, sharing. Aceasta e, adică, plecăm de la premiza că e o lume deschisă în lumea în care trăim, ca generație, această lume va rămâne cu siguranță deschisă încât pentru fiecare fundație, pentru fiecare întreprindere, pentru fiecare persoană, e important ceea ce face. Doi, lumea este clar că îi avantajează pe cei care pun întrebări, pe cei care iau decizii, pe cei care întreprind lucruri noi. Și în sfârșit, suntem convinși ca fundație că investiția în inovatori, și creator este cea mai bună 
investiție pe care o poate face o, o fundație. Astăzi, cum spuneam, avem privilegiul și onoarea de a-l avea ca oaspete pe profesorul Suel Najar. Dați-mi voie ca foarte succint să îl introduc, să prezint personalitatea domniei sale. Încă la noi se discută puțin în viața publică despre neurologie. Sigur, și eu îmi spun să nu ajung la medic. Și, în general, să nu ajungem la medici. Dar, pe de altă parte, trebuie să spunem că dacă este o știință foarte dinamică astăzi, și cu siguranță sunt mai multe, una din cele mai dinamice, aceasta vreau să spun, este neurologia. Nu mai este domeniu care să nu fie atins de ceea ce se face în neurologie și invers, neurologia folosește ceea ce <coughs> multe domenii folosesc. Eu vă spun asta nu ca medic, dar vă spun din lecturi filozofice. În filozofie luptăm din greu să rezolvăm și noi problema relației dintre ceea ce englezii numesc mind, să zicem minte pe românește, și brain, ceea ce tot englezii numesc creier. Și sigur, fără neurologie nu se poate lămuri această problemă. Toți în liceu v-ați confruntat cu filozofia lui Platon și a fost foarte grea. Nu se înțelegea ce spune Platon. Acum avem răspunsuri mult mai precise din partea neurologilor. <coughs> Sigur, domnul profesor Suel Najar reprezintă, cred eu, văzând și lucrările, cu brio, reprezintă superlativ, reprezintă la cel mai înalt nivel, domeniul neurologiei. Sigur, în medicină diviziunile sunt stricte, specializările sunt foarte ascuțite. Dânsul, în mod clar, este la această oră cel mai bun specialist în, în probleme de autoimunologie, deci de cercetare a sistemului imunitar din punctul de vedere al apărării lui vis-a-vis -vis de maladii, de amenințările maladiilor și, sigur, ca efect practic, în chestiunile epilepsiei, domnul Profesor uh, Suena Rajar este o referință mondială certă. Uh, sigur, cei care au urmărit filmele americane ați putut vedea și în film un personaj care a fost ajutat de un doctor să se vindece de o boală care avea atingere cu autoimunologia și sigur, doctorul era chiar profesorul uh, Najar, deci este și un personaj de film deja, domnul profesor Najar. Sigur, în momentul de față, ar fi multe de spus despre traseul biografic al profesorului Najar și, de obicei, aceste trasee, în multe țări se studiază, pentru că noi, de generații, trebuie să vadă cum se poate deveni celebru medic, celebru fizician, celebru chimist, matematician, etc. Dar mă refer doar la actualitate, din 2014 până în prezent, domnul profesor Najar este Chairman of Neurology la Lenox Hill Hospital, New York. I-am și spus, văd că gravitați doar în jurul New Yorkului. Este clar că New York e foarte atrăgător și oportunitățile sunt enorme. Domnul profesor Najar este, din 2014 până astăzi, Chairman of Neurology de asemenea la State în Island University Hospital, profesor și chairman la Department of Neurology la Donan Barbara Zucker School of Medicine, tot lângă New York, chairman of Neurology la North Shore University Hospital și chairman of Neurology la Long Island Jewish Medical Center, așișterea lângă, lângă New York. Însă are un traseu pe care uh, a marcat uh, mereu cu rezultate de cercetare uh, de referință internațională uh, progresul în uh, neurologie și în special în ceea ce am spus în domeniul uh, autoimunologiei. Uh, pe traseul dânsului, sigur, uh, uh, au intervenit diferite universități, în sensul că dânsul a fost uh, profesor, a fost uh, în contact, a fost angajat în cercetări, pe lângă Columbia, pe lângă Boston, uh, iar în Europa, pe lângă uh, rețeaua spitalicească legată de medicina de la München. Medicina de la München este și ea una din cele mai relevante, oricum în Europa uh, e la vârf și profesorul uh, uh, Najar a fost de asemenea și aici, este implicat în programele de, de aici. <coughs> 
E destul să spun, data aceasta, sigur, presei, că știți bine, New York Magazine întocmește anual lista celor mai buni doctori și observ aici 8 ani, 8 ani, 9 ani, 10 ani, profesorul Najar a fost declarat New York's Best Doctor, unul din cei mai buni doctori din, din New York. Acestea fiind spuse, vreau să exprim încă o dată satisfacția de a avea alături de noi o personalitate de talia profesorului Najar. Vreau să exprim certitudinea că și întâlnirile pe care le va avea cu specialiștii la București și cele de la Cluj, cu medicii din cele două centre, îi vor da pe de o parte prilejul să cunoască ce se face aici și după cum va da prilejul multor colegi din țară să ia legătura cu totuși cel mai bun specialist în epilepsie de la această oră de, din lume. Aceasta este uh, faptul simplu care cred că rezumă importanța a ceea ce a făcut și desigur a ceea ce face domnul Rajar. Trebuie să mărturisesc că când m-a fost informat că vin aici, mă gândeam că trebuie să fie un senior gârbovit de ani, uh, dar am întâlnit o persoană tânără cu siguranță care va avea încă multe de spus în cercetare și în viață. Vă mulțumesc. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words and the wonderful introduction. How wonderful it is to be here with you this morning and to visit wonderful city. I'm really honored and privileged and grateful to the wonderful invitation from Alexandrian Foundation and in particular I'm grateful to to its president, Dr. Nawaf Salami, and his wonderful wife, Reem Dawood, for offering me such an opportunity to visit Romania. When I was told about my visit, I was really both astounded and uh, incredibly uh, happy uh, to be here. I was really very much looking forward to be here, and I know I'm gonna already start having great time. It started last night. And uh, I'm here not so much to talk about myself, to talk about what I represent, what our profession all about. Indeed, the award that I received from Constantin Brancoviano, International Award from Alexandria Foundation, is such a prestigious award and recognition. It served as a reminder of why I entered medicine, what our medical profession all about. It's about healing illnesses and advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. It's about the sacred relationship we all talk about between physician and patient, about trying to do the right thing for the patient every single day, especially knowing that the disease does not respect any boundaries or any book. And you always you have to think out of the box to save people's life. This is a very, very, very special thing. If you learn to live medicine, and in my case, living neurology, this will make you really a better physician. Not to practice medicine, but live it. Susanna Kehalen's story as an example of when we face seemingly hopeless situation, you have not to surrender, but try to overcome it. And you have to think harder and be innovative in order to reach the right diagnosis. This is an example when the physician needs to treat the patient as a whole and not only the illness. And try to think in the three dimension because the disease often have a three dimension. In Susanna's case, if you look at only psychiatric dimension, you're gonna miss the diagnosis. You're gonna reach wrong diagnosis. But if you look at it from three dimensions, then you have more chance to make the right diagnosis. 
This is a story of need to bridge the gap between neurology and psychiatry and to limit professional isolation that currently exists between those two closely related fields. Her story tells us how many people were not fortunate enough to have the right diagnosis and locked up on psychiatric wards from disease could have been easily treated. How many people lost their life from mysterious illness? When she recovered, and I'm thrilled to say that she has completely recovered, she wrote her story first in New York Post. And the title of her article, My, Mo My Month of Madness, describing her own story of rapid, mysterious descent into madness that was unexplained. And then that she wrote a book, Brain on Fire, and the title of that book is the word I used first when I met her parents during the first visit in the hospital. After she was approximately hospitalized for a month with no real diagnosis, and the final impression was probably she has psychiatric illness. And when I met her and her parents, I knew it's not. But I have to convince the world it's not mental illness. She was seen by many specialists from multiple disciplines from a major medical center in the heart of Manhattan. You talk about neurologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychiatrists, infectious disease, immunologists, cardiologists, internists. She was seen by other specialists outside the institution. And the final verdict, she's a problem with schizophrenic suffering from psychotic episode, probably triggered by alcohol with the draw. This is a lady who really barely could drink any alcohol. Why? Because there was such a huge resistance to accept such psychiatric symptoms can be neurologically based. This is what I'm talking about, the, pro the product of the professional isolation between psychiatry and neurology. Because we don't know that neurological disorders can sometimes present with overwhelming psychiatric symptoms, mimicking mental disorders. She was a victim of that professional isolation. And that's why she was labeled initially as schizophrenia and psychosis. But when I get more history from her, although she was catatonic, and everybody felt she can contribute to the history, and they were wrong. It took me time, sat with her, but she gave me the clue. She gave me the clue to make the diagnosis where million dollar workup to include the three MRIs and spinal tab and so forth did not yield the right diagnosis. In, in any, as a matter of fact, it yielded into the wrong diagnosis because her MRI is normal, blood tests are normal, and she's acting psychotic. But the test that I did is called clock drawing test. But why I did that? I start early telling uh, you about you have to be innovative every day in what you do. You have to live neurology, not to practice it. I know my colleagues made the wrong diagnosis. Now it's up to me to prove it, that it's neurologically based. And I know it was quite challenging when you go against medical establishment and the popular opinion. I wasn't popular back then. They knew that I usually deal with mysterious cases. That's why they asked me to get involved after one month of hospitalization with no diagnosis. But when I need to go against everybody's diagnosis, that was not easy. And now the burden on me to prove is she's actually neurologically based, she has neurologically based illness. She's a neurological patient and not a psychiatric patient. That's what I was trying to do. So the clue that she 
gave me, along with her parents, that one month before she became fully psychotic and developed seizures, she developed this flu-like symptoms, a viral-like illness, a little bit headachy, muscle ache, maybe a little bit low-grade fever. And then she had developed a bed bug sensation involving the left side of her body. She felt there's a, a bed bug attacking the left side of her body. I'm not aware of any bed bug just effect, at, attack only one side of the body. At least if it's a true bed bug, it affects the whole body. So I know that something happened with the right side of the brain that controlled the left side of the body. That's what the neurology is all about. It's an art. It's about localization. So when she had this funny sensation, a form of sensory hallucination that is regulated by the right side of the brain that controls the left side. And in particular, parietal lobe, which is the area of the brain that controls sensation. So now I need to find a way to confirm the disease started a few weeks before hospitalization and started on the right side of the brain and spread out. And if I could provide that evidence, then suddenly she became a neurological patient and not a psychiatric one, not a mental health illness. That test that I used, a very simple test, a simple tool. I handed over a piece of paper and asked her to draw a clock. And what she did, she squeezed all the numbers of the clock from 1 to 12 on the right side of the clock face. And the left side of the clock face was empty. Like the left side of her visual sphere, the visual field does not exist, is non-existent. This phenomenon in neurology we call left-sided neglect. I mean, the right side of the brain pathology caused her to ignore or not to pay any attention to the left side of the uh, visual space. And that would be consistent with the bed bug sensation, all neurology now. That simple test allowed me to leave her room, having that paper in my hand, showing everybody that she is a neurological patient. She is not a mental health illness. While million dollar workup from three MRIs, spinal tap, extensive plus test, all negative with the exception of a little bit of inflammation spinal tap, was not diagnostic. So the million dollar workup failed to make diagnosis, of, as a matter of fact, led to wrong diagnosis of schizophrenia. And that simple test that was established and validated in early 1900, it's not a new test. We knew about it early on when they used it to screen for cognitive impairment in soldiers initially who sustained head injury involving parietal and occipital head, the back of the head. And now we use for Alzheimer and stroke. But in the era of sophistication and advanced technology, we forgot to resort to that simple test. Doesn't cost much. And to make quickly diagnosis what's happening with this patient. First, I use the right side of the brain infected and spread out. And I have to explain to the family at that time. And I have to explain to my colleagues. That disease was not well known. Now we refer to it as anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. So how to explain to them what that disease? It's barely known. So I said, well, her brain is inflamed. It's like her brain on fire. And little I know that become the title of New York Times bestseller book, and later on adapted into movie. I told my family, look, I'm genius. I knew this was going to be a movie. I used such an attractive title. It was not about that. I was trying to explain to them what I really thought of her illness. I really pictured her brain was on fire. And that's why she acts so psychotic. But the brain MRI failed to show that. How many Neurologists, until this very day, rely on imaging of the brain to classify diagnosis. So if you have some symptoms, appear to be psychiatric with anxiety and mood, or psychosis, and the brain MRI is normal, then they tell you, go see 
psychiatrist because the imaging is normal. And now we know the imaging is normal more than 80% of people who have inflammation of the brain. We didn't know that back then. That's why it was difficult for any physician to accept the fact this is really uh, neurological illness. And from them, and that confirmed it with the brain biopsy, which showed that actual inflammation, and we treated her. And within six months, achieved dramatic recover, uh, improvement. But took her close to a year and a half to two years to achieve complete recovery. I'm honored to be her doctor. And I'm thrilled that she has completely recovered. What an inspiration person she is. She's the true hero of that story because she made much out of it. She wrote about her illness. And her book, and later the movie Brain on Fire, raised tremendous awareness about that illness. It touched many hearts and saved many lives. I can't tell you how many emails I get every day from people across the country and throughout the world asking me about loved one and sometimes about themselves, they think they may have some kind of autoimmune problem of the brain, because that's what that disease. When the body's immune system turns against its own body tissue and causes inflammation, damage, and in, in, in her case, the inflammation was in the brain, caused a change in her brain chemistry, we refer to neurotransmitters, and she acted psychotic. It's unbelievable what she's done. We, I lectured for more than 15 years about autoimmune disorders of the brain. At the time, they were not popular or well known. But her story brought awareness more than my 15 years of lecturing. That's why she's a true hero, because she did not only think about herself. She made sure that nobody should go through what she went through and no life should be lost as a result of misdiagnosis. And more importantly, think about the patient as a whole. Think about the patient as a human, even when that individual is catatonic and not able to talk. Still, take your time. Sit. Don't stand up next to the patient. Take the time to get the history, because they often they have the clues in their histories. That's a lesson for me, a lesson for a lot of physicians. And saving someone's life is such a very special and rewarding experience to both patient and doctor. And I have to tell you, as a result of that, created an unbreakable bond between me and Susanna. She's, I have three children, and she's a fourth. It's an unbelievable story that sometimes remind me it's worthwhile I entered medicine and why we do that every single day. Again, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you all for being here, for listening to that. And uh, I would like to really thank Professor Marga for really wonderful comments uh, about me, but it's not about me, it's about the patient. It's about taking science to another level, really bridging the gap between psychiatry and neurology, no more professional isolation. We have lo a lot of work in this area, and now as a result of her book, we have more research in the field of immunology of the brain. Because immunological disorders affect the brain often present with psychiatric illness so now we go back in the history, those cases of demonic positions, some of those in retrospect could have been a disease similar to Susanna Scahelan illness, where the immune system, antibodies, tackling the brain tissue and cause psychiatric symptoms because psychiatric symptoms are the most common symptoms of immunological attack against brain. Thank you with that. Welcome your comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Najar. Thank you. Dacă aveți întrebări, e o conferință de presă, așa că întrebările sunt inocente, răspunsurile vin taxate, nu? Hello, welcome to Romania, welcome to Bucharest. 
Sebastian Popescu of uh, recent news. Um, Dr. Tell me what are the most common cause of symptoms of uh, autoimmune encephalitis? Great. Thank you for your questions. It's an important question. What's the most common cause, uh, uh, most common symptoms of autoimmune encephalitis? Autoimmune encephalitis can cause by many antibodies, and every year or so, we discover new antibodies we didn't know about it before. So for instance, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, which is the type of encephalitis Susanna K. Halen has, that antibody first described in 2005, five cases, then 2007 they give him the name, and then 2008 we have 100 cases, in 2013 we have more than 500, and now we have thousands and thousands. Why? Because of the awareness about that illness. Symptoms, the most common symptoms, as I said, psychiatric, psychiatric symptoms. Psychosis, cognitive issues, mood disorders, delusions, hallucination. That's how usually they start at first. Some change in personality, a little bit anxiety, a little bit agitation, and then develop some cognitive issues, short-term memory, and then seizures, uh, movement disorders, some kind of abnormal movements, we refer to as dyskinesia, so a little bit twitches of the arm or some abnormal movements of the mouth or tongue or sometimes abnormal posturing, we call dystonia. And then they develop uh, uh, autonomic instability, a phenomenon referred to erratic fluctuation of a blood pressure pulse rhythm. And uh, if the diagnosis not made at that time, they basically lapse into uh, stupor state or coma, and sometimes they die uh, from uh, cardiac arrest and central hypoventilation, meaning inability to breathe as a result of a brain uh, dysfunction. So a constellation of a change of mood, psychiatric symptoms, cognitive decline, seizures, abnormal movement, and then catatonia. Indeed, now we reclassify catatonia in the old days, catatonia, purely mental illness. And we called catatonic schizophrenia and so forth. Now we know 50% of people who are diagnosed to have catatonia actually have an autoimmune disorder of the brain. And the only manifestation, catatonic, which is a state characterized by positive motion. Everything stops and affects most of the young population. So when I see a person present with those symptoms, especially of rapid onset, rapid deterioration, often intractable to typical psychiatric medication, then I think about autoimmune, and you have to do the proper workup. Uh, to include now, we have commercially available blood tests for the majority of those disorders. But now we know around close to 40%, maybe more, of those patients who have immunological attack on the brain, we don't have biomarker in the blood, meaning we don't know the antibody, new antibodies. So we're still discovering every year or so new antibodies. So with that discovery, we expand the spectrum of autoimmune encephalitis of the brain. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Another question? Hello, my name is Vlad Panets from Business Launch Magazine. I was curious, what is the right treatment for, for this disease? Okay. So, the, it's immune therapy to control the inflammation in the brain caused by the antibodies attacking the brain. So the first line of treatment, a form of steroid, given intravenously, and then often in, with the intravenous immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin is antibody derived from thousands of healthy donors and infused intravenously for those, in, in, for those individuals with those disorders. So almost good cop against bad cop. So that good antibody control or counteract the harmful effect of the bad antibody that tackling the brain and also reduce inflammation in the brain. So we call it immunoglobulin, often used intravenously. And sometimes we do plasma exchange when we hook up that patient to a big machine that takes a few units of patient's blood and separate it into two components, liquid component, which is a serum that potentially harboring those harmful antibodies, 
and the cell component, which will transfuse back into the patient's body. The liquid component that potentially harbor the harmful antibodies, we get rid of it and replace it with normal saline. So a kind of washing a person's blood, basically, from those antibodies to wash them out. For those who do not respond to the first line of immune therapy, we advance it to second line of immune therapy, which is more powerful, but more toxic and more risky. Luckily, I didn't have to do that in Susanna's case. And those are a strong uh, immunosuppressive agent that strongly suppress immune system and multiple medications such as rituximab and cyclophosphamide. There are a variety of those really disorders. In Susanna's uh, case, I managed to really uh, cure her illness using only first-line immunotherapy, which includes steroid, intravenous immunoglobulin, and the plasma exchange. So the majority of people respond if you treat them early. And uh, about 75% of people achieve complete or near complete recovery. 25% they have residual deficits. So all based on how early you make the diagnosis and how aggressive the treatment. That's why if you treat early, the chances to achieve full recovery is 75%. So you wonder a lot of those patients like Susanna before 2007, before anybody knew about that illness. How many people left undiagnosed and really, it's scary just to think how many locked up on psychiatric wards and some of those patients died. At young age, this is a disease of young age, often young females of childbearing age, like Susanna. Uh, death in those cases approach 15% in the old days, but now less than 7%, maybe less than 5% because of increased awareness and uh, early treatment. Any more questions? Bună ziua, Ileana Vlădus, mă numesc de la revista Dr. As. Aș vrea să ne spună, domnul doctor, câteva cuvinte despre părerea dânsului referitoare la rolul și importanța neuroplasticității creierului în vindecarea pacienților care au leziuni cerebrale sau encefalită autoimună. Excellent questions. The role of neuroplasticity. First of all, let me just talk a little bit about autoencephalitis and the broaden really the discussion. Uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis, the target for the antibody in Susanna's Kehalan, those receptors mediate cognition, memory, emotions, but also regulate neuroplasticity, ability for nerve cell re regeneration. That's what basically plasticity is all about. So if when you impair those cells, you impair the plasticity. And uh, when you eliminate those antibodies, the nerve cells recover. And that's why, despite the fact the patient can be terribly sick, but they can't fully, re uh, can't achieve full recovery in majority of the cases. So now, as we know more about those illnesses and other neurodegenerative disorders and traumatic brain injury, a lot of investments in therapeutic strategies, research programs targeting neuroplasticity as one methodology to reverse neurological illness to include spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, even in neurodegenerative disorders such as uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, other disorders of the brain to include inflammatory really disorders. But still at this point, at the level of research, and there are a lot of animal models being done to investigate the possibilities of uh, inventing drugs that promote, enhance neuroplasticity in order to promote recovery and limit injury. A lot of those drugs may work on not only receptors, but on inflammatory mechanisms, because inflammation can limit neuronal plasticity or neuronal uh, regeneration. So still at this point, not in the clinical practice, but I bet you within 10 years from now, you will have more novel treatment targeting those specific mechanisms, and I think that's the future. 
Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other question? Hello, I'm Andrea, a fourth year medical student. I would like to ask if is a genetically transmitted disease that affects the receptors and is triggered by environmental factors or just yeah. environmental? I'm sorry, one more time, I didn't hear the whole point. If it is a genetically transmitted okay. disease. Yeah, genetic factors you're asking yes. about, yes. So this is really important the question because some of us in this room may have antibodies against NMDA receptor antibodies, but we don't have the disease. And the question, when person exhibit the symptoms, does that mean this is when that person developed antibodies or they have it before? So believe that there are some genetic propensity to develop those antibodies. In Susanna's case, we don't know what are those genetic. But we know autoimmune disorders in general tend to be genetic. And that's why those individuals often have a family history of autoimmune disease, some sort of autoimmune disease. Doesn't have to be the same autoimmune disease. Some person could have rheumatoid arthritis. One of the family could have multiple sclerosis. Other they could have psoriasis or thyroiditis or Crohn's disease. They come in different shape and forms. But one third of patients who have autoimmune disease, if you dig in in the family history, you find that family members, relatives may have a close relative some form of autoimmune disease. It doesn't have to be the same one. So we know there are genetic factors. In Susanna's case, uh, Susanna uh, K. Allen uh, situation, we don't know what are genetic factors, but we know there's some genetic probably propensity that is really poorly defined. But then you have to have a trigger factor. And we think it's a product of the illness of both immunological trigger and some genetic propensity in some patient at least. And those immunological triggers could be viruses. That's why in uh, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, 70% of those individuals exhibit prodromal viral-like illness. Indeed, in some patients, virus was detected, such as herpes simplex, among other viral agents. So infectious agents and some genetic propensity those click together and produce the disease in some patient. But no well-defined genetic inheritance pattern or dominant inheritance documented in those disorders. But definitely uh, uh, genetic risks are well known uh, in, in that field. Yes, I think uh, Professor uh, Najar uh, has given uh, quite a lecture introductory lecture for us as beginners. Thank of course. you. But uh, it was very, very clear uh, what uh, you are doing, Professor Najar. Thank you. You, you have uh, argued in a very intuitive manner what uh, does it mean, and I'm sure that uh, interest for neurology in this country will be will increase after uh, your uh, interventions. Thank you. I thank you very much, the newspapers, the journalists, the televisions, for giving attention to the initiative of the foundation to have uh, such a profile, such a uh, prestigious personalities like uh, Professor Najar yeah, as guests honor. here in Bucharest. Okay. And I am sure, Professor Najar, that you will be under assault in the next days. Uh, coming from different uh, journalists, uh, specialists, students, etc. Thank you very much for your very, very convincing Thank argumentation. Thank you very much again for your kind invitation and to be at Bucharest. I enjoyed the city and really it's an honor and privilege to be with you all. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Very pleased.